Isa alayhi salam comes down as a warrior. He's coming down to destroy the Dajjal and destroy the army of the Dajjal. So what happens? Isa alayhi salam descends. Isa alayhi salam catches up to the Dajjal. So while they're in that situation, someone announces that Juj and Majuj have broken loose. This is a big problem. This is a big issue. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Isa alayhi salam that you cannot handle Juj and Majuj. So go and hide with my servants in the mountain of Atur. We're going to get to all of that. Who are Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Let's look at this. And let's see, is it really such a mysterious situation? Let's start from the beginning of the story. The, the Kuffar of Quraysh, they sent to the Jews in Medina. We have a man here who says he's a prophet. Give us some tough questions to ask him. So we can stump him and prove that he's not a real prophet. And they got three questions from the Jews. And then the one we want here, they said, ask them about a man who used to travel the earth. They're referring to the Al-Qarnayn. So, who was a righteous king who lived before. The Al-Qarnayn is not Alexander the Great. If there's anything that's unbelievably annoying in this world, it's people who think that the Al-Qarnayn was Alexander the Great. There's not even a similarity, at least go for someone similar. If you've heard of Cyrus the Great, Cyrus is closer to the time period of the Qarnayn. It would even make more sense because Cyrus was righteous and everything. Why is it called the Qarnayn then? Al Qarn, horns. So what does it mean horns here? Mean the two ends. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him kingdom of the eastern and western ends, Al Qarnayn here. But it's not because he had actual horns. The questions that the Jews posed came down in the form of a great surah and a great blessing for the Muslim Ummah, Surat Al-Kahf. So we start from verse 82 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ And they ask you about ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُ ذِكْرًا I'm going to tell you some of his story. إِنَّا مَكَّنَّا لَهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا We made him established and firm upon the earth and we gave him to everything a way or a means. A way here either a path that he could seek, or it means that we give him the means for having power and victory and tamkeen being established and, and firm upon the earth. فَأَتْبَعَ sababa could mean, so he followed a way, a path. Or, فَأَتْبَعَ sababa so he used the means that we gave him. He makes three journeys, a journey to the west, a journey to the east, and a third journey. Here's the journey to the west. حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ مَغْرِبَ الشَّمْسِ until it, when he got to the setting of the sun. The sun sets in the west. So when he got to the place of the setting of the sun. Well, what does that mean? What is the place of the setting of the sun? Keep going uh, west for as, for as long as you can. Then when you get to the end of the land, what will you see? You will see just water. And then when the sun sets from your vantage point, what does it look like? It looks like the sun set into the water. Uh, he found it setting in a spring of dark mud. Uh, Ibn Kathir here says that it sets into the water. So he found the people there in that place, this far west place. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now is going to test him. So we're going to test to see what kind of king you are. Are you fair? Are you good? Are you just? So either you are going to uh, punish them or else adopt with them a way of goodness. So his answer... As for the one who wrongs, and here the Mufassirin said wrongs here means he does kufr and he does injustice and he persists in his wrong way, we will punish him. Then he will be returned to his Lord and he will punish him with a terrible punishment. And as for the one who believes and does righteousness, he will have a reward of al-husna, of paradise. وَسَنَقُولُ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِنَا يُسْرًا And we will speak to him from our command or our position with ease. Ease here. Meaning, we'll deal with him and speak to him with kindness. So he followed another path, or he used the means that we gave him. Now, we're looking at a second journey. Let's look at the clues. Verse 90. When he got to the place of the rising of the sun. That's the east, isn't it? تَطْلُعُ عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ لَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُمْ مِن دُونِهَا سِتْرًا he found it 
rising upon a people that we have not made between them and the sun a shield. So this could be east. But also some said this could be the north and very high up north, meaning this could be somewhere, not necessarily the North Pole, but the Arctic Circle. And it encompasses uh, northern Canada, Greenland, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Russia, um, Alaska, Iceland, all of them have territories that are within the Arctic Circle. Now what's interesting there is the sun rises on March 22nd and it stays up in the sky. It doesn't set ever for six months. It stays up March, April, May, June, July, August, September 21st, finally the sun sets. So it's been up for six months. And the other, the opposite pole and south pole is the exact opposite. Six months of darkness, six months of sunlight. So here's the question. When Allah said, لَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُمْ مِن دُونِهَا سِتْرَ we, didn't, we did not put a barrier between them and the sun. Would it make sense that this could be the, the Arctic Circle, meaning the sun is always up and there's no barrier? Because one barrier between you and the sun is what? Nighttime. So is there any problem right now with this explanation that they don't have a barrier between them and the sun, that they could be in the north or in the Arctic Circle where the sun is always up and there's no barrier, meaning no night? It makes complete sense. We're not saying this is the tafsir. What I'm trying to allude to is what we said in the beginning of this series, that because we're dealing with the unseen, there could be more than one plausible explanation. What else shelters you from the sun? Clothing shelters you from the sun. So, so some scholars said they are a primitive people that don't wear clothing. So they don't have any barrier between them and the sun. They don't have clothing and so therefore they're a very primitive people. That's one explanation. Another explanation Others said there are primitive people who don't build homes, don't know how to build homes, they just sleep outside. And so that's how they have no barrier between them and the sun. Is it plausible? As far as our verse and our clues, it is extremely plausible that they could be in the, in the very high north Arctic circle and they get no shelter from the sun because there's no night. It could, it's still, according to our tafsir, very plausible that they are primitive people who don't know how to build homes and they sleep outside. Three. It could be that there are people who don't wear clothing, they're backwards. Four, some scholars said that they are a people who live in a desert. Compare people who live in a desert to people who live in thick, deep, dense jungles. Which one of them has no barrier from the sun? The desert people are the ones who are always exposed to the sun. We had all these explanations, all of them very plausible. All of them don't contradict and they match the verse perfectly well. It doesn't have to be a journey to the, to the east. It could be to the east, could be to the north, it could be to the north or northeast. The truth is, none of us have seen, we leave it to the unseen. Another important thing to know here, it's not a riddle, it's not like uh, it's a mystery and your job is to figure it out. Don't. It's not a mystery and you're supposed to fill in and fi figure out the clues. It's clearly hidden from you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hid that. It's the unseen, it's with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. ثم أتبع سببا, a third journey. So he followed the, the, another path, or he utilized the means. حتى إذا بلغ بين السدين. In the English translation it says, reached a pass between two mountains. And they are not wrong. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say جبلين. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically said سدين. Even though there's not an exact word in English, but in Arabic, what's the difference between a jabal and a sad? So in Arabic, a, a dam that holds off water is known as a sad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically called these two mountains saddain, like they would work as two dams. So he got to this area where there's these mountains, and then there's an opening between two mountains like that. How do I know there's no other opening? It's from this clue, because Allah didn't say jabalain. Said Dain, it acts like a dam. That means there's only one way in or out. Otherwise, it wouldn't be like a dam. So if a river hits a mountain, what happens? It just goes around it. Water finds its way, right? It's going to go around that mountain, around the boulder, around any obstacle. But when it's called a said, that means the water can't go anywhere. And that was the clue. That's why the Quran is so amazing. Wajada min dunihima qawma. He found, not inside there, but outside of these, the, the, the two mountains, 
found the people. What's their description? لا يكادون يفقهون قولا. In another recitation, another قراءة of the Quran, لا يكادون يفقهون قولا. What's the difference? So they're not able to communicate, all right, or they're not able to understand. يفقهون they can't cause you to understand anything. يفقهون they themselves cannot understand anything. The language is a more popular explanation. What's interesting here is that where is this third journey? Some think this third journey also is in the northeast or is not far from the second journey. Could be northeast in the north somewhere. Now there's some uh, historians, uh, Muslim historians, Al-Qazwini, Al-Idrisi, Al-Mustawfi, Ibn Hawqal, they all drew maps kind of high north. Their, their estimation to where Yajuj and Majuj are or were and these maps are about a thousand years old. They drew them showing the barrier in northern Russia, in Siberia, in the Caucasus regions. What's amazing is that you'll find videos on YouTube of, of the dam of Yajuj and Majuj. And it's amazing. Like, they'll be in Kyrgyzstan and, and all these, in the Caucasus regions again. Expeditions, people with these SUVs driving around. And then they just stop and then just stomp their feet like this. And like, this is it. We're standing above Yajuj and Majuj. Really? So casually, I'll never forget this one presentation on YouTube in Arabic where the guy has Google Maps open and he's going through, he's showing. So the whole, the whole show is just, you see a screen, a projector and a screen, and you don't see the guy, you just see his finger pointing on the map. And the map keeps moving and he's just showing you ex as if he was part of the, the, the journey or the expedition of, of Dhul Qarnayn. He's telling you then they stayed here, then they stopped here for like a few days, then they had coffee over here, then they went over there, and then they stopped right here, and this is where Yajuj and Majuj are right now. So casually pointing to a map and telling me they're right there, this is a really big deal. And this is something that Allah intended to be hidden from us, so you're going to tell me, there it is right there, and you just know that? A lot of crazy things online. We don't even know if it was really to the east, to the north, to the northeast, we don't know, and the historians and others before us couldn't figure out exactly where it was. So it doesn't work like that exactly. He found these people who could barely communicate. Either they could barely understand speech, or they could barely communicate with you. And part of that could be they were weak mentally, and I'm going to give evidence to that, that what scholars said they were mentally not very strong, or uh, their language was a very rare language. Their language was so distant, and it could be that they were so mentally so primitive that even sign language was different for them. What does Dhul Qarnayn do with these people? What do they ask of him? They said, Oh, Dhul Qarnayn, Yajuj and Majuj are great corruptors in the land. Can we basically pay you that you put a barrier between us and them? He said, the power in which my Lord has established me, يعني, basically what my Lord has given me is better than what you're offering me. As far as your money, I don't need your money. فَأَعِينُونِي بِقُوَّةٍ He says, but assist me with labor. Even though he has enough, but he's getting them involved. And it's their issue and it's their problem. And they shouldn't just sit back and someone else does the work. They have to take part in it. أَجْعَلْ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ ردما. They ask for a said, and he's put, saying, I'll put a radm. One possible difference here is that he's describing what he's going to do as far as the, the procedure. He's going to put a radm, meaning this said he's going to, he's going to basically pile it up and, and close it off like that. He says, bring me zubar al-hadid, big block, chunk of iron like that. And then when until he got to, it filled up the space between the mountains, the two steep mountains. These two mountains, there was a space in the middle between them. This is an opening. And he kept piling them up, piling up these chunks of iron until completely filled it up. He said, blow. And any human being who wants to say the barrier is not real and it's, phys it's not physical, it's figurative, we have to sit down with them and you have to go through this verse by verse, word for word, and explain to me what figuratively, what this would mean figuratively. And why did he ask for their labor, their quwa? And just, it doesn't make any sense. For God's sake, those people who say this, give it up. 
it's a dead end, it's not going anywhere. So, blow, until he, when he made it a fire. What does that mean? You've got chunks of iron, he said blow on it, blow what? Fire, light up a fire and blow, just like a foundry, you know, and that's how you create intense heat, with fire and a blow, like that's why the, the bellow, if you've seen that, you know, um, the bellow blower, he's using that to make that fire hotter, to melt that metal. So then, when he made it into a fire, how does iron become a fire? I think it's clear. So it melted now. He says, then, bring me so that I may pour qitara over it. Now here, this translation said it's molten lead, but no. Qitara, molten copper. For uh, human beings, for the longest time ever, have made this mixture, meaning com combined, iron with copper. Why? Because iron, as you all know, if it, you know, water touches it or a lot of humidity, it rusts, it becomes iron oxide. And over years and years and years, that rust will completely eat through something that's iron or metal. But people knew for, the, for thousands of years to, when they have something iron, to cover it with molten copper. Why? Because copper, when it reacts with the oxygen in the air, it turns dark, right? That's a very thin layer and that becomes copper oxide and that is resistant to further corrosion so the copper itself be, because of that layer will not corrode or, or deteriorate and therefore whatever iron is behind it that it was put to protect will also be protected so we've got even a mixture of these two very specific metals in this very specific way after it was all melted and it completely this thick incredibly thick wall of, of pure metal now, he covered it with a, a thin layer of molten copper so that it can preserve it and it could last for thousands of years. What is figurative about that? I think it's very clear, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَا اسْطَاعُوا أَنْ يَظْهَرُوهُ وَمَا اسْتَطَاعُوا لَهُ نقبة. Now here we have actually some very interesting clues in this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they could not climb over it, and they could not make a hole through it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used different words, slightly different words, for being capable or able. What's here in the translation is, it doesn't make a difference. Like in the translation, you can't see the difference. And that's why the beauty of the Quran specifically comes out in its original language, in Arabic. So Allah says, they cannot climb over it. So, sta'u for their uh, ability here. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicated that in this verse 97, that it would have been easier for them to climb over it. They couldn't make a hole through it, but it would have been easier to climb over it. So, the question is, why didn't they try to climb over it if climbing over was easier? Number one, because what the scholars described of them not being very intelligent to begin with. So, they weren't smart enough to try to go over it and it would have been easier for them. The second explanation should be the obvious one, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala steered them away from the easier one because He wants them to remain there for a long period of time, for an appointed time, and they're supposed to come out at a specific time. If they were steered or guided towards choosing the easier one, they would come out. But that's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. And that's why they never considered to climb over, but they're trying to do the harder one, which is to dig the hole through the barrier. 